Hello everyone and welcome to the 2022 Swim Learn Finals for the Three Minute Thesis and the Visualise Your Thesis. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country and we respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who are the traditional owners of the land on which Swinburne's Australian campuses are located in Melbourne's east and outer east. And we pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging. We're honoured to recognise our connection to Wurundjeri country, history, culture and spirituality through these locations. And we strive to ensure that we operate in a manner that respects and honours the elders and ancestors of these lands. I also respectfully acknowledge Swinburne's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders staff, students, alumni, partners and visitors, and acknowledge and respect the traditional owners of lands across Australia, because we're virtual, so you may be joining from other lands, and their elders, ancestors, cultures and heritage, and recognise the continuing sovereignties of our, all of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. I'd like to introduce our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Pascal Cuesta. Thank you very much, Georgie. And as we uh, saw this beautiful fire pit, I was reminded um, that yesterday we had the, the pleasure of actually inviting physically our new international students and, and recognised that we were doing so on Wurundjeri land, which is a very special treat. Hello, everyone. I am so pleased to be with you today, even though I probably won't be able to stay for the full gamut, but I know that you're in for a lot of fun. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Swinburne's final of the Three Minutes Thesis uh, and Visualise Your Thesis competition. Uh, in the spirit of today's proceeding, I'll keep my address uh, short. I know that the talk is clicking, so it's going to be three minutes, no more. But thank you, everyone, for uh, participating this year. A huge congratulations to uh, the finalists who will be presenting today. It's a very exciting time to hear from our students around the university and to start to get a picture of just how innovative, creative and intelligent work is happening around the, the place. And there's nothing like a little bit of friendly and healthy competition to get the best out of people. And that is very much what the three minute thesis and visualize your thesis allow talented students to do, compete with the best and communicate their work. The 3MT has now grown to span about 900 institutions in 85 countries. And in each of those countries, the challenge is the same. How to summarize something that is like 80,000 words and has taken three years to write and will take more than nine, hour, nine hours to read, how to summarize it in three very precious minutes. And of course, in Visualize Your Thesis, it's even worse. It's one minute video and you've got to condense the whole bit into that one punchy video. So fantastic privilege for us to see and, and be informed and inspired by the creativity and, and the importance of the topics that our students uh, have been undertaking. And these international competitions really do give our HDR and PhD students a chance to showcase their research and step confidently on the world stage. In fact, last year, engineering PhD student Matthew Shaw actually was in the same position as you were right now, but in, went on to win the Asia Pacific 3MT with his brilliant presentation, Lunacy, on how it is that we could actually learn to build and live on the moon. Although I'm told that the moon is only a stop over to Mars. So maybe we need, we need to have the, the next presentation by one of our students on how we do that. And of course, um, uh, Swinburne's first entry into the Visualize Your Thesis uh, last year, Ratanapat Sushat actually took the third place in the international final with an excellent work on Thai brand nostalgia, just a story in itself. So my own research is actually on consumer behavior. So I really get the importance of being able to provide a clear message and, and inspire people to imagine something that they would not have thought about, about otherwise. And this is really very opposite to what research tends to be, where you talk to learned peers who know all about your work and you go into the sort of very specific of your work. This is about explaining your research in clear, simple terms that lay persons and people who are not expert in your field really get. And it's actually important because unless we can actually make our research relevant 
and, and understandable by people, it's going to be very hard to justify more funding for research because we will remain a bunch of obscure people talking about obscure things. So what you're doing today is actually a really important skill in your career as a researcher, learning to explain the benefit of your work in words that are easy to understand is actually the toughest of all tasks. But um, I know that the candidate and finalists today have done this in, in very good stead. So I know that we are amongst converts here. We all believe in the merit of the three minute thesis. Uh, I thank you all for participating. I do realize the amount of effort that went into those precious three minutes and in the one minute of visualize your, your work. Thank you also to all the people involved in organizing the competition. I know training and support has been provided by Swinburne Research, Learning and Academic Skills, Communications and Library staff. Uh, we are at, at Swinburne are absolutely right behind our students. We want to share the research with the rest of the world. We want to be confident on the, on the global stage and it starts today. So best of luck, everyone. I'll be able to see a, a, a first few before I have to disappear, but I know it's going to be a lot of fun and I look forward to seeing the impact of your research uh, as it touches on the, on the rest of, of the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Quester. I too would like to acknowledge the masses of work that's gone into getting to this point behind the scenes, the training, the support, the ADRs and ADRTs in the schools who ran the school level competitions, uh, Sylvia Mackey, the learning and academic skills advisors, our own Charlotte Coles, who ran the training and set up Canvas sites for the, the students to learn those skills. Uh, the uh, Commons team, the library staff who supported the, the copyright staff, everybody has come together and that's been just fabulous to see and so much benefit for our students. Even if they didn't get to this stage, so many others have participated in that training and learned some skills. Just some housekeeping to begin with, the People's Choice voting will happen at the end of each set of videos. Uh, there'll be a Zoom poll pop up, so please make a note of, of your favourite and um, that's something we always look forward to. Uh, the comments are disabled in this format here, but you can use emojis if you, if you want to express, express your joy or delight and celebrate with, with the candidates who put so much work into this, feel free to use your emojis. Uh, I'll begin here we'll start with the 3MT and the 3MT is it has been a long-running competition it's founded here in Australia and the challenge is three minutes with one slide and present your thesis uh, it, it supports research communication skills and development uh, the hardest part sometimes as a researcher is learning how to explain your ideas and concepts using language and words that are understood by the general public. Uh, so this is a great way to hone those skills. Uh, your presentations are considered to commence when the, you start your speech. This time limit is very, very strict. Uh, this year, everybody is participating with a video entry and you're allowed one static slide for the presentation. So there's no additional props, uh, no, no costumes, musical instruments, waving laboratory equipment around, anything like that. It's all about the presenter and how they convey their enthusiasm, uh, understanding and knowledge of their topic. Uh, the, the judge's decision is final. So while you're thinking about your people's choice uh, vote, the judging criteria are based on comprehension and content, firstly. So did the presentation provide a uh, overview? Did it explain the background, the significance, what the research was going to address? Was there thought put into explaining what the impact of that work was going to be at the end? Uh, how did the presenter engage with the audience and communicate? Were they enthusiastic? Uh, did they manage to get that language right? It's so tricky to not be too technical, but also not trivialize or make things so general that it's not about this specific project there. And what was the value of that PowerPoint slide? Did it aid the presentation? Was it clear? Was it concise? 
was it confusing? Uh, so we're aiming for clear and concise. So those are your criteria to think about as we uh, move into our 3MT here. Oh, and before I begin, we've got the judging panel have been able to join us here and I really appreciate the effort and time that these people contributed. Uh, Vonda Fenwick is the CEO of SEMA, the Southeastern Modern Manufacturing Association. Uh, Dr. Emma Lee is our Associate Professor with Indigenous Leadership and Mike Legastes is Deputy Director of Communications and Media. So we had a very diverse panel there to judge these presentations. Thank you all. Uh, we've got some fabulous prizes for our winners. The Swinburne winner will get a $1,500 research grant and entry to the Asia Pacific level. The runner up gets a $550 research grant. And then the People's Choice also gets a $500 research grant. For the, if, for, if when our representative moves on to the next level, the winner of that level gets a much larger grant is $5,000, the runner up gets $2,000. And there again, there's a people's choice uh, and $1,000 for that one as well. So I'm going to begin the three minute thesis competition, the Swinburne final for 2022 by uh, handing over to our finalists to introduce themselves. So finalist one, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Georgie. Hi, I'm uh, Andre Narayan. I'm representing the Center of Human Psychopharmacology within the School of Health Sciences. Uh, I hope you enjoy my three minute thesis entry titled Cannabis to Stop Counting Sleep. Thank you. Did you get a good night's sleep? When it comes to bedtime, most adults can easily go out like a light. But for those with insomnia, it's not as easy to get a good night's sleep without lying in bed, counting sheep, or waking up throughout the night before they ever plan to get out of bed. Without a good night, a good morning is difficult to achieve. We know that poor sleep can make us feel terrible and reduce our ability to think and react to our environment, putting us and others around us in harm's way. Current medication for insomnia requires a doctor's prescription and has harsh side effects, including extended drowsiness, trouble functioning the next day, and even addiction. Now, that doesn't sound too safe, does it? But growing popularity and changing laws around medicinal cannabis allow sleep scientists to explore the claims of thousands of years of traditional medicinal use all the way up to modern day anecdotal evidence. We singled out the many compounds of cannabis and look at a particular one called cannabidiol or CBD that has recently been made available in Australian pharmacies without the prescription. CBD when consumed produces no intoxication we typically associate with cannabis. And in theory, we think it may enable parts of our brain and body to get each other to calm down to allow the buzzing minds of those with insomnia to easily go out like a light and have a good night turn into a good morning without having to count sheep or worry about side effects. But does the 150 milligram dose of CBD available in Australia really work for insomnia? My research is the first to test this, and it dreams to put the anecdotal claims of CBD through the rigor of scientific testing. By having those with insomnia take a nightly oral dose of CBD oil before bed for three weeks, and measuring their sleep using a specialized sleep watch, all from the comfort of their cozy homes. In the lab, we measure their mood and cognitive performance to help paint a picture of how CBD, disrupted sleep, mood, and daily functioning might interact with each other, and to draw conclusions on the efficacy of CBD as a sleep aid, helping to clear the air around medicinal cannabis use whilst providing those with insomnia 
a possible safer option to choose from to ensure everyone not only has a good night, but also a good morning. I hope you sleep well. Is Maggie here? Would you like to introduce yourself, Maggie? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Joshua. Um, I'm Maggie from the School of Business Law and Entrepreneurship. Um, it's my honor to enter into the semi-final and thank you for the opportunities. Um, my research is related to how artificial intelligent AI help organizations and how should the organization implement AI. So hope you can know more about my thesis from the video and we'll enjoy the video. Thank you. I still remember when I witnessed in the emergency room of the hospital in Hong Kong. There were four patients, most of them were children and elderly. Meanwhile, doctors and nurses were crazy busy and kept moving around. You know, in Hong Kong, because of the healthcare personnel staffing shortage, sometimes people have to wait for more than eight hours at emergency rooms. I know. It's not unique to Hong Kong, but it's a global issue. To resolve the problem, researchers and developers explore different emerging technologies. I bet most of you will think of artificial intelligence AI, the system that learns from data and performs human-like actions. It's true that a lot of effective AI applications have been developed, but not all AI implementation can improve performance. According to a report published in 2019, 7 out of 10 organizations found minimal or even no impact from AI implementation. So it seems that AI implementation is not as simple as we imagine. And that's where my research comes in. Studies have shown that Organizations have to possess some specific capabilities if they want to implement AI successfully. So what are these capabilities? They would be AI knowledge, data, and organizational culture. And they would be the key to success in AI implementation. In my research, I conducted case studies and interviews with organizations using AI in Hong Kong to explore what these capabilities are, how these capabilities complement one another, and how AI helped the organization to create business value. If organizations know more about the capabilities of AI implementation and the mechanism of value creation by using AI, they will be more likely to implement AI successfully. I hope in the future, we will see more and more successful AI implementation, and so organization can improve their performance. Then the problem that we are facing, like the healthcare personnel staffing shortage that I mentioned at the start, can be relieved with technology. Hi, my name is Emma. Thank you so much for attending today and supporting our research. And a special thanks to all the support from my colleagues, friends and family. So I'm a third year PhD student in biomedical engineering technologies, and I'm supervised by Professor Sally MacArthur and Paul Stoddart. My, my talk is titled, Shining Light on Lab-Grown Tissue, 3D Picture Saves a Thousand Lives. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the world has seen the devastating effects of a fast spreading virus but it also saw one of the biggest worldwide collaborative research efforts to find a viable vaccine within the space of a year, efforts that saved millions of lives. But did you wonder what the scientists tested their vaccines on? To test vaccines safely and accurately, we can make biological models that mimic the human response. The simplest models are cells attached to a flat 2D surface in a petri dish. These cells can only move and grow along that flat 2D surface. In the real world, cells don't exist in a petri dish. They exist in organs and muscles and wibbly wobbly tissues. 
In fact, previous studies have found that almost 40% of FDA trials failed due to poor reproducibility, as studies that worked for cells and flat surfaces did not translate to human tissues. Hi, my name is Emma, and as a bioengineer, I seek to replicate human tissues by mixing cells through jellies like gelatin to make 3D lab-grown tissue. Gelatin is a string-like form of collagen, which makes up 30% of the human body, trapping water, cells, and DNA. These 3D lab-grown jellies more naturally reflect human physiology compared to cells on a flat 2D surface. My PhD looks at how light can be used to see how the cells behave inside these 3D jellies. When held up to the light, jelly is semi-translucent, as some light transmits through, while other light scatters around the string-like gelatin. In light of this, I design 3D tissue jellies that can be used to tackle questions related to imaging and sensing. The first question I asked was how does the different properties of jelly, such as the degree of wobbliness, affect light and what we see? The results showed that cells near the edge of the jelly were easy to see. However, for thicker jellies, the light was scattered too much and the cells deep in the center could not be seen. The second question I asked was how does the cellular complexity so the types of fruit in the jelly change the light passing through the jelly. Skin cells were like blueberries. The structures were small and there were lots of them, and they were nicely distributed. Neuron cells were a bit more like passion fruit. The seeds were easy to find, but the tasty yellow pulp was difficult to see. In conclusion, my research designs 3D lab-grown tissues that can be used to understand how light from new imaging tools interacts with jelly. It demonstrates how the different properties of lab-grown jelly will impact how instruments see the cells inside. As a direct outcome, more medical research will start adopting 3D lab-grown tissues that better mimic the human response, producing higher quality research in medicine, cosmetics, and most importantly, vaccines that will continue to impact and save thousands more lives. Hello everyone, my name is Jamie Hislop. I'm from the School of Engineering and my thesis is about the ergonomics of keyhole surgery, uh, robotically, like the system behind me, um, and manually. And I um, just wanna introduce my presentation, creating a clearer picture of the strain of keyhole surgery. Imagine you're trapped at the top of a cliff, holding on to your partner for dear life. You don't understand why she's not climbing to safety, because you can't see the snake that is right above her head. And she doesn't understand why you're not pulling her up, because she can't see the boulder that is crushing your back. This is a dire situation. Everyone is hurt and no one has all the information. This is the perfect analogy for my research on the strain of keyhole surgery. Manual keyhole surgeons operate with long tools and watch what they're doing on a 2D monitor. Robotic surgeons operate from a console with dexterous hand controls and a 3D visual display. Both types of surgery cause pain and lead to surgeons reducing their operating hours or even retiring early. Researchers have been investigating this problem for decades, but small studies often only focus on one measurement technique, and so it's very hard to get a clear picture of what's going on. Everyone is hurt and no one has all the information. My research is about combining this information and creating this clearer picture. By combining data from two dozen studies, I showed that over half of robotic surgeons and three quarters of manual keyhole surgeons experience pain while operating. My own survey study showed an even higher rate of pain. And I also found that many surgeons were just burnt out and that there was a correlation between their mental burnout and their physical symptoms. I then combined muscle activity data from 10 studies and showed that manual keyhole surgeons 
experience significantly more bicep strain than robotic surgeons. My own muscle activity and joint angle data confirmed the higher level of muscle strain that manual surgeons experience. My data also showed that robotic surgeons have incredibly unhealthy back angles from leaning forward to look at this 3D visual display. And they maintain this position for hours while operating. So by combining this survey, muscle activity and joint angle data, I've created a much clearer picture about surgical strain for everyone to see. And using this information, we can now get all of these surgeons out of this dire situation. Hello. Hi, I'm Kesra here again. Uh, I'm from the School of Business Law and Entrepreneurship. I'm in the second year of my PhD and my research presentation title is the impact of environmental, social and governance related new sentiment on firm performance. And I hope you enjoy my presentation. Can you remember the Facebook company's data scandal? In 2018, New York Times reported that Facebook has shared data of more than 50 million users without permission. Maybe your information was also there. Guess what happened? Within days, Facebook's market value dropped by more than $36 billion. What companies do for the environment and society and to improve governance is known as corporate ESG performance. Companies report these actions in their annual reports and sustainability reports. Yes, even Facebook has its sustainability reports. But do you think Facebook reported about its data scandal? Now this is the issue with relying on information companies report by themselves. Companies exaggerate their good behaviors and hide their bad behaviors, which is known as greenwashing. This is why news and social media become alternative and powerful sources of information. And that's where my research comes in. My research examines whether external news about ESG performance can affect companies' financial performance. When we read news about a company, we create an image in our minds about it. Let's call this image created from ESG-related news the ESG news sentiment. Now, how can I know what others think about a company like Facebook? Well, for that, I use news sentiment ratings. They indicate the tone of ESG news taken from millions of news articles published in thousands of media outlets. I conducted panel regression analysis and found that when there's a lot of good news about a company's ESG behavior, that company experiences financial benefits. At the same time, when the news is bad, then it's financially bad for the company. This knowledge is mainly useful to investors for their investment management. Further, some investors prefer investing only in socially responsible companies. They want to make sure that their money is not used for unethical purposes. However, there are no compulsory regulations of a company's own ESG reporting. So, independent, external news is the best solution currently available to be aware of companies' actions which they might not report themselves. So, if you ever come across a company report that says they have been doing really good for the environment, society and governance, think twice or read wise. Hi everyone, my name is Nina Imad and I am presenting Sustaining Play, Sustaining Health on behalf of the School of Health Sciences. Do you know someone that has suffered or even died from a heart attack, a stroke, diabetes or cancer? Because I sure do. And did you know that all of these conditions and many more are linked to obesity? But what if I told you that this could be prevented? Not when you're 40, not when you're 60, but when you're a one year, two year or even a five year old. Yes, that young. Because studies show that habits that develop when you're a child tend to continue when you're an adult. 
So, if you're a two-year-old that's just sitting around all day watching cartoons, you're more likely to be doing the exact same thing when you're an adult. Heard of Netflix? So, why do we want to prevent obesity? Well, because it is one of the leading causes of preventable deaths globally. In fact, in 2021, the World Health Organization reported that at least 2.8 million deaths each year were a result of overweight or obesity. That is a tragically high number. The World Health Organization also reported in 2019 that 38.2 million children under the age of five were overweight or obese globally. 38.2 million. Now think back to what I said about habits. Okay, let's see how we can reduce these numbers. There have been so many programs developed to prevent the rise of obesity globally with a specific focus on childcare services. Now some of these programs in Australia aim to help children meet the physical activity and sedentary behavior guidelines because a simple way to prevent obesity is through physical activity. And although these programs have shown successful results, 83% of children in Australia still do not meet these guidelines. Why, you ask? Well, that's because services are unable to continue these programs once support by the organisation delivering the program is removed. And generally, that support is removed after one to two years. But what about the 10 years after that? What about those kids? One to two years is not enough time to prevent obesity in children. And this is what my thesis is all about. My research looks past that one to two years. It looks at 10, 20 years in the future. Helping childcare services maintain these programs to benefit the children that come in after support is removed, something which hasn't been done before. To help sustain these programs, I'm developing a number of strategies that will target the main challenges with long-term delivery, and then I'll be testing these in childcare services. If I can help these services sustain the programs that have proven to be effective, then I guarantee we will see the number of children with obesity drop and inevitably reduce the tragically high number of deaths caused by obesity. Because health is the goal, and now I put the ball. Hi, I'm Sam Mackay and I'm from the School of Science, Computing and Engineering Technologies and my presentation is titled Nutritious Pollution. I hope you enjoy. Nutritious Pollution. Not exactly two terms you'd think go together, in fact it's a bit of an oxymoron, but nutritious pollution is actually a huge problem. I'm talking about plant nutrients, the stuff in fertilizer that you'd put on the garden at home. See, people in our activities have led to way more nutrients being present in water bodies like lakes and rivers than have any right to be there. And this causes problems not only for the environment, but also our health and the economy, because we use water for a lot of things. We grow food with it, we drink it, we spend our leisure time enjoying it and nutritious pollution threatens these. So clearly nutritious pollution is negative, but it's negative in more ways than one. Sure, it has negative effects, but many nutrients are also literally negative. They have a negative charge, which means they're attracted to a positive charge. Now, I'm not the first person to try to use this to remove nutrients from water, but I am taking a slightly different approach. I'd like you to meet Dean. Well, technically, his full name is diethyl amino ethyl chloride. You can see why he goes by Dean. Now, Dean's a bit of an extrovert. If you leave him on his own, he's neutral. Not happy, not sad. But if you put him with a bunch of his buddies, other Dean chemicals, well, now he's happy. He's positive. So the idea of my research is to take Dean and stick him to the surface of a material, say a piece of string and then to join him to a bunch of his buddies, creating a whole chain of Deans reaching out from the surface. And since all these Deans are together, they're happy. Meaning we've created a material packed full of positive charge. Negative nutrients are attracted to this positive charge, meaning we should be able to use this Dean containing material to remove nutrients from water. 
And in my research, this works. At my lab bench under controlled conditions with the nutrient I've tested so far. The trick now is to expand on my results, to get this idea to work in the real world as well as it's working in the experiments at my lab bench. This means looking at complex real world conditions and the kind of challenges we'd face in transitioning out of the lab. But maybe with a little bit more research and a lot less lockdown, I can get this idea off the ground, or more accurately in the water. So we can start dealing with the negative nutrients that threaten how we use water every day, cleaning up nutritious pollution with the help of Dean and his buddies. Hello everyone, my name is Shravan Muthukrishnan and I'm from School of Engineering. As my backdrop says, we don't have housing crisis, we have affordable housing crisis. Can automating the whole construction industry solve this issue? If yes, then what are the limitations? All of this will be answered in my pitch. Many said being the last presenter can take away some attention, but please remember, the showstopper comes last. Fasten your seat belts, enjoy my presentation. Thank you. Did you know, according to the United Nations, the global population is set to reach over 11.2 billion at the end of 21st century. This means we need more than 2 billion new houses. The statistics are even more frightening for developing and underdeveloped countries where the need for sanitation facilities like toilets are as much as the new houses. Many previous studies have stated that concrete 3D printing has the potential to solve this issue. But what is concrete 3D printing? Concrete 3D printing is an automated construction technology that utilizes robot to place the fresh concrete layer by layer until the design structure is built. If concrete 3D printing can solve the housing issue, then on what expenses? As concrete 3D printing does not require costly formworks, the fresh concrete used is much stronger than its traditional counterparts. However, this means the amount of cement is high and cement is a major source for carbon dioxide emissions. This makes the whole process less eco-friendly. Secondly, the fresh strong concrete needs to be pumped and printed shortly after mixing. If it stays in the pipeline for long, it starts to set and damage the machine. This results in reduced or even no lunch breaks for machine operators. If concrete 3D printing has to be successfully implemented in construction industry, it has to take care of one, the high cement content, second, the reduced flexibility for machine operators. And this is where my PhD comes in. I have developed a cement free mix that stays in the pipeline for weeks, but once it leaves the print head, it starts to gain the strength that is required for concrete 3D printing. This is just like a two-part epoxy. When we buy this two-part epoxy, it stays in the cabinet for days, months, or sometimes even years. But once you break the package and mix the two part together, it starts to harden instantly. If my mix doesn't have any cement, then what are the binding components? I'm using industrial wastes as the binding component. This not only increases the eco-friendliness of the concrete because we don't use cement anymore, this avoids this waste to be dumped in landfill or water resources and contaminate them. My research have shown that the cement free mix which I have developed has similar and in some aspects better properties than the cementitious counterparts. Please have a look at this image again. The need for housing and sanitation facilities are real. Let's solve this issue in the right way. Thank you. Okay, well, that's going to be a hard choice for all of you to make with the, the voting here. So just a, a reminder that we ran through the judging criteria before, but please keep in mind that people didn't necessarily have access to great technology to record their presentations. So 
So please allow allow a bit of leniency for though if you thought the that maybe the sound quality or the, the image quality wasn't great. Everyone's done their best with their what they could get their hands on to do these. So think about whether you understood the research, whether you understood what each presenter was trying to do, did you understand what the impact of that work was going to be? And was it communicated in a way that you as an intelligent but not specialist audience could understand? Uh, did you want to know more? Are you keen to go? Did you find yourself making a note and thinking, I'm going to go and Google that later and find out more about that? That sounds fascinating. Uh, did the speaker capture your interest? Uh, were they confident and, and engaging and, and just make you think, wow, that's amazing research. I want to know more about that. And so as a bit of a memory prompt, because being, it's been eight fabulous presentations in very rapid succession here, uh, we've popped up a slide here with the, the presenters and their titles so that you can think back over them and think, wow, which one am I going to give my vote for? Remembering that the person who gets the most votes will um, win $500. Uh, so there is a poll. Where is the link for the People's Choice? Paul is going to pop it up in a minute. So it will come up, there you go. So everyone, you've got two minutes to vote for your favourite and there's 276 people here to cast a vote. So that's an excellent, excellent distribution of people there. I'll stop talking while you have a think about that. So everyone in the audience should be able to see a pop-up window where you simply click on a circle to vote for your favourite. And you only get to pick one. You know what, Georgie? I just realized I'm the only male candidate. <laughs> so, oh my God, that's so cool. Don't worry, most of us, are, you know, picked that up as well. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's wonderful. It's a wonderful, but the topics are so diverse. Don't yeah. you? It's, it's... I loved every presenter. So good. You're going to have to be the cheerleader for next year, Sh Shravan. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, that was amazing. And now pre prepare to be amazed in a completely different way with the Visualise Your Thesis competition, the, the finalists for Swinburne this year. This is a relatively new competition. Um, and so the challenge here is for our HCR candidates at any stage of candidature to prepare a one minute video. So three minutes was tricky. Now we've got one minute to, to grab people's attention and explain their, their research to, again, a, a lay audience of you know, intelligent but not specialist uh, people. Uh, 
this is a great for us, you know, uh, not only building digital literacy skills, but also learning about copyright and, and what you can and can't do with, with uh, content that you find on the internet. So here, while you're watching these videos and remembering that there'll be an opportunity to vote again for your favourite, you need to think about, uh, does that one minute give you an understanding of the research question, its significance and potential impact? Is the communication uh, in a format and language that's appropriate for a non-specialist audience? Again, does it leave you feeling inspired and curious? Uh, is it well-designed? creative and engaging? Is it visually striking and memorable? Uh, we've had a fabulous judging panel for this competition as well. And I'd just like to thank uh, Associate Professor Nadine Zacharias from Student Engagement, Associate Professor Stefan Shepherd, who's here um, in Forensic Psychology and also our ECR uh, leader and Thomas Sheffe, who's our Research Data Management Coordinator. So thank you to our judging panel. And uh, we've got prizes. Again, they match the prizes for the 3MT because the challenge is equally difficult. Uh, the winner will get $1,500, the runner-up 550, and the People's Choice will get 500. And again, the international finals offer larger prize money with the winner getting $5,000, the runner up 2,000 and the people's choice there, 1,000. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Andreas. I'm from School of Engineering. Today, I hope you will enjoy my presentation about recycling and refining of silicon and silver from waste solar cells. Enjoy. again. I'm Kate Rahim again from School of Business Law and Entrepreneurship. I'm in the second year of my PhD and again my presentation is about environmental, social and governance new sentiment and its impact on firm performance. So I hope you enjoy this presentation as well. Thank you. Companies report their actions regarding environment, society and governance, or ESG in short, but they generally exaggerate their good behaviours and hide bad behaviours. Remember when Facebook shared user data without permission? Facebook did not report this, only news articles revealed it. Therefore, news and social media become alternative sources of information to learn about companies' ESG impacts. The image we create about a company from the news we read and hear is called the ESG news sentiment. I examine whether the ESG news sentiment can affect company's financial performance. I find that when there's a lot of good news about a company's ESG behavior, that company experiences financial benefits. Similarly, when the ESG news sentiment is bad, company's financial performance suffers. My research highlights the importance of being receptive to external news to predict how companies might be affected financially. Uh, 
Uh, hi everyone, my name is Mohsen from School of Design and Architecture and my research is related to the investigate the effect of ambient and smell on human emotion through uh, processing the brain and peripheral signal and I hope you enjoy my presentation. Ninety percent of human life is spent in architecture and interior spaces. All interior spaces, such as office, gym, hospital, library, and so forth, have a special smell. We smell as we breathe, so architecture and ambient smell can affect us. In this study, we seek to investigate the effect of ambient smell on human emotion through the recording and analysis of brain and peripheral signals. To this end, we designed experiments in which participants were present in similar rooms that inhaled different ambient smell. Then, using the latest neuroscience tools and technology, the participant brain and peripheral signal were recorded by biosensors. Analysis of the data show how the smell of different spaces affect the human emotions. The result of this study helped to use the smell as a parameter to design more effective spaces on human emotions and can promote the mental health and well-being of human in interior spaces. I'm Nilusha Galage, representing School of Business, Law, and Entrepreneurship. Students in developed countries like Australia and students like us studying in universities such as Swinburne have the privilege of developing capabilities as young entrepreneurs. But this is not the case in emerging countries. And even the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals aim to increase youth with relevant skills for entrepreneurship. My research explores how university ecosystems prepare students for entrepreneurship in resource constrained environments. I hope you enjoy watching my entry. Thank you. In developing countries, inequality impacts all social and economic foundations from food and health to higher education. Due to lack of entrepreneurship skills and support among founders, emerging economies such as Sri Lanka suffer high startup failure. Universities and their ecosystems drive emerging economies, but they often lack resources to help their students thrive. So how can university ecosystems prepare students for entrepreneurship in resource constrained environments? I interviewed 40 stakeholders to deepen my understanding of this issue across six diverse groups. Next, I offer recommendations for universities battling this problem. The goal, to support all students, including future self-employed entrepreneurs and employer sought entrepreneurs. In so doing, I hope also to advance the quest for education equality. Hi all, uh, myself Nirmal, a third year PhD student trying to understand the energy aspects of oxygen steel making process. Glad to be one of the finalists for the Visualize Your Thesis to convey a very important message to reduce the global warming and how to make the huge steel making industry an efficient one. Hope you will enjoy this video. Thank you.
<clears throat> Very good afternoon to all. My name is Sasha. I'm from the School of Software and Electrical Engineering, and I hope you enjoy my VYT presentation titled Robot Energy Optimization, a Repositioning Paradigm. Thank you. There are approximately 3 million robots operating around the world with many new additional robots being installed each year. Each robot consumes some energy, whilst lots of robots use lots of energy to operate. This energy costs money and can negatively impact on our environment. The goal of this thesis is to reduce the energy consumption of industrial robots by understanding the relationship between user programming and energy consumption. Initial experiments have revealed that robot posture affects energy consumption, and that there are so-called low energy idle postures and high energy idle postures. Further work has led to the development of a low energy repositioning paradigm, which uses color coded guidelines to assist users in selecting low energy configurations. Flame testing has determined that this method can successfully reduce the robot idle energy consumption by up to 33%. Now it's time to implement the findings in the real world. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Shu Hao. I'm a third year PT student from School of Science, Computing and uh, Engineering Technologies. My video is about uh, an eco-friendly method to remove the nitric oxide in the flue gas. Hope you like it, thank you. Nitric oxide is a kind of pollutant that exists in the air. It will produce oxygen and photochemical smog which will cause serious damage to buildings and humans. The flue gas from the combustion of fossil fuels are the main sources of nitric oxide. To solve this problem, another gas named ammonia is used to remove nitric oxide in the flue gas. Ammonia can react with nitric oxide and turn it into harmless nitrogen. However, ammonia would also be a pollutant if leaked into the air. Also, the production of ammonia will bring additional costs. So we are trying to find another solution. Carbon monoxide is another harmful gas in the flue gas. The catalyst we developed can make the carbon monoxide and nitric oxide react with each other to form harmless nitrogen and carbon dioxide. By using this technology, we can remove the two harmful gases simultaneously. Hi everyone, I am Tariq and uh, I am from the Department of Civil and Construction Engineering. Um, my topic of presentation is uh, could congestion pricing be the solution to Melbourne's post-COVID traffic woes? So I hope you will enjoy my presentation. Thank you. Melbourne's congestion is back to pre-COVID levels and is expected to increase as commuters increasingly rely on their private vehicles and reduce their usage of public transport. Traditional methods to reduce traffic congestion has met with limited success. My research investigates the role of innovative road network pricing for managing travel demand and promoting low carbon mobility. I am using a simulation model developed for Melbourne to test various road pricing scenarios. I have tested different pricing schemes. The findings to date shown that it is possible to achieve a reduction of 7% in traffic density, 20% in travel time, 13% in emissions, as well as 3% increase in travel speed. Okay, so once again, you get to vote for your favourite to decide who is going to win the People's Choice Award for the VYT. Again, very tough decision. Reminding you about the judging criteria here. Um, did you understand what the research was trying to address? Uh, what its significance and potential impact was? What difference is it going to make to us? Was it communicated 
in an engaging way using the appropriate format and language for a broad audience? Did you wonder more about it and want to know more about it? Uh, was it visually striking? Because of course it is visualize your thesis. So, so was, was the visual impact there? Was it well-designed, creative, innovative and engaging? Uh, again, the poll will pop up in a minute and uh, you'll have two minutes to decide. As a reminder here, here are our fabulous, fabulous entries. Uh, so have a think about quickly who your, who your favourite was, who you're, who you're going to vote for. Very hard decision to make. And uh, just like to say thank you to all of those people. For the, the, the work that went into those videos was really obvious. So well done everybody who, who made one of those videos. Thank you. You should be able to see the poll now. It should have popped up on your screen and you get to choose one of those finalists there. Sing a little song, Georgie. <laughs> Be the whole music. <laughs> Uh, okay, so unfortunately, Karen can't be with us today. Um, so on behalf of Karen Hapgood, who is our Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research, I'll be making the presentations. And oh, thank you, Paul. So I've got these, got this written down. Um, so the 3MT, uh, People's Choice Winner, was Shravan Christian. So well done, Shravan. You did say you were going to present us with the showstopper there being last. Sorry, I didn't listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited for my name. I was like, oh, my, my ears were blocked. <laughs> uh, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Great work. Can you should, should, I give, should I give Vinod's speech now or maybe afterwards? <laughs> should I give Vinod's speech like Oscar, I forget Oscar, uh -huh. <laughs> some speech, right? 
say is that allowed here or afterwards we hadn't actually planned for that because so we'll give you 30 <laughs> seconds hey how, no, how no 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 i was just think? i was just kidding i was just kidding Jody. <laughs> i was just kidding <laughs> can i just ask um all of the finalists to turn your cameras on please um because if you're going to receive an award paul will need to be able to find you make sure that you're there <laughs> thanks very much okay thank you uh, the runner-up for the three-minute thesis is Nima Imad with sustaining, sustaining Play, Sustaining Health. So congratulations. Thank Nima. you so much. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, and first is Andrea Narayan with Cannabis to Stop Counting Sheep. So well done to all of you and well done to all of our finalists and all of the people who uh, participated in the school rounds as well. But look at all those emojis going. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> it's a great way to start the day. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, and on to our, our Visualize Your Thesis awards now. Uh, the People's Choice winner for Visualize Your Thesis was Kasara Hwadji. Sorry, Kasara. Uh, and I just... Thank you. In, in, in the impact of environmental, social and governance related news on uh, company performance. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's okay. So well done you for having a go at both. Uh, the the runner-up is uh, Mosin Cafe. So well, congratulations, Mosin. Thank you. Thank you so much. On investigating the effect of ambient smell on human emotions through processing brain and peripheral signals. And finally, the winner is Tariq Munir. So congratulations, Tariq, for your presentation on could congestion pricing be the solution to Melbourne's post-COVID traffic woes? Something we're all experiencing. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't expecting, by the way. <laughs> So congratulations to everybody. Uh, again, our finalists and and all of our participants. Now, I just want to put in a plug for the next level competition. So the Virtual Asia Pacific 3 and T competition. If you would like to go along to that, and again, there's going to be a People's Choice Award, and I'm sure Andrea would appreciate all of the support that she can get from Swinburne people here. Uh, the semi-finals are on the 26th of September, and the final is then on the 10th of October. So that'll be very exciting, and we'll send around some notices to remind people. Uh, for the Visualise Your Thesis, the final is, to, again, toward the end of October. Um, I looked it up just before, and it'll be uh, part of the e-research conference that'll be held on the 17th to the 21st of October. Again, there's a people's choice competition there and uh, you can vote virtually for that. Um, I think you can vote in advance of that one, but we will, we will have a look and we'll get the word out because again, it will be great to uh, support Tariq to, in that competition as well. Uh, so there'll be more information there on the internet. Um, just before I go, there was a question in the chat about whether the recording will be available. And yes, it will. It will be a day or two, but we'll be able to get that out there in case you want to have a look at it or share the recording with friends or family who couldn't be here today. Uh, so just before we have a look at the winners, uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming along today. I can see from the numbers that we've had not just our contestants and our own candidates and supervisors coming along, but we've had friends and family and a range of uh, Swinburne staff as well. So 
thank you to our fabulous research community, friends and family for coming along today and supporting these wonderful competitions. They're the highlight of my year. And I hope that you've really enjoyed this as well. So just to close, we're going to recap the winners from this year. And thank you. Did you get a good night's sleep? When it comes to bedtime, most adults can easily go out like a light. But for those with insomnia, it's not as easy to get a good night's sleep without lying in bed, counting sheep, or waking up throughout the night before they ever plan to get out of bed. Without a good night, a good morning is difficult to achieve. We know that poor sleep can make us feel terrible and reduce our ability to think and react to our environment putting us and others around us in harm's way. Current medication for insomnia requires a doctor's prescription and has harsh side effects, including extended drowsiness, trouble functioning the next day, and even addiction. Now, that doesn't sound too safe, does it? But growing popularity and changing laws around medicinal cannabis yes. allow sleep scientists to explore the claims of thousands of years of traditional medicinal use, all the way up to modern day anecdotal evidence. We've singled out the many compounds of cannabis and look at a particular one called cannabidiol or CBD that has recently been made available in Australian pharmacies without the prescription. CBD, when consumed, produces no intoxication we typically associate with cannabis. And in theory, we think it may enable parts of our brain and body to get each other to calm down, to allow the buzzing minds of those with insomnia to easily go out like a light and have a good night, turn it to a good morning without having to count sheep or worry about side effects. But does the 150 milligram dose of CBD available in Australia really work for insomnia? My research is the first to test this, and it dreams to put the anecdotal claims of CBD through the rigor of scientific testing. By having those with insomnia take a nightly oral dose of CBD oil before bed for three weeks, and measuring their sleep using a specialized sleep watch all from the comfort of their cozy homes. In the lab, we measure their mood and cognitive performance to help paint a picture of how CBD, disrupted sleep, mood, and daily functioning might interact with each other, and to draw conclusions on the efficacy of CBD as a sleep aid, helping to clear the air around medicinal cannabis use whilst providing those with insomnia a possible safer option to choose from to ensure everyone not only has a good night, but also a good morning. I hope you sleep well. Melbourne's congestion is back to pre-COVID levels and is expected to increase as commuters increasingly rely on their private vehicles and reduce their usage of public transport. Traditional methods to reduce traffic congestion has met with limited success. My research investigates the role of innovative road network pricing for managing travel demand and promoting low carbon mobility. I'm using a simulation model developed for Melbourne to test various road pricing scenarios I have tested different pricing schemes. The findings to date shown that it is possible to achieve a reduction of 7% in traffic density, 20% in travel time, 13% in emissions, as well as 3% increase in travel speed. Do you know someone that has suffered or even died from a heart attack, a stroke, diabetes or cancer? Because I sure do. And did you know that all of these conditions and many more are linked to obesity? But what if I told you that this could be prevented? Not when you're 40, not when you're 60, but when you're a one year, two year or even a five year old. Yes, that young.
because studies show that habits that develop when you're a child tend to continue when you're an adult. So if you're a two-year-old that's just sitting around all day watching cartoons, you're more likely to be doing the exact same thing when you're an adult. Heard of Netflix? So why do we want to prevent obesity? Well, because it is one of the leading causes of preventable deaths globally. In fact, in 2021, the World Health Organization reported that at least 2.8 million deaths each year were a result of overweight or obesity. That is a tragically high number. The World Health Organization also reported in 2019 that 38.2 million children under the age of five were overweight or obese globally. 38.2 million. Now think back to what I said about habits. Okay, let's see how we can reduce these numbers. There have been so many programs developed to prevent the rise of obesity globally with a specific focus on childcare services. Now, some of these programs in Australia aim to help children meet the physical activity and sedentary behavior guidelines because a simple way to prevent obesity is through physical activity. And although these programs have shown successful results, 83% of children in Australia still do not meet these guidelines. Why, you ask? Well, that's because services are unable to continue these programs once support by the organization delivering the program is removed. And generally, that support is removed after one to two years. But what about the 10 years after that? What about those kids? One to two years is not enough time to prevent obesity in children. And this is what my thesis is all about. My research looks past that one to two years. It looks at 10, 20 years in the future. Helping childcare services maintain these programs to benefit the children that come in after support is removed, something which hasn't been done before. To help sustain these programs, I'm developing a number of strategies that will target the main challenges with long-term delivery, and then I'll be testing these in childcare services. If I can help these services sustain the programs that have proven to be effective, then I guarantee we will see the number of children with obesity drop and inevitably reduce the tragically high number of deaths caused by obesity. Because health is the goal, and now I've got the ball. Ninety percent of human life is spent in architecture and interior spaces. All interior spaces such as office, gym, hospital, library and so forth have a special smell. We smell as we breathe, so architecture and ambient smell can affect us. In this study, we seek to investigate the effect of ambient smell on human emotion through the recording and analysis of brain and peripheral signals. To this end, we designed experiments in which participants were present in similar rooms that inhaled different ambient smell. Then using the latest neuroscience tools and technology, the participant brain and peripheral signal were recorded by biosensors. Analysis of the data show how the smell of different spaces affect the human emotions. The result of this study helped to use the smell as a parameter to design more effective spaces on human emotions and can promote the mental health and well-being of humans in interior spaces.